All right, so welcome all to this webinar, the 10th staged by our project on populism and constitutional democracy, which is funded by the Australian Research Council. And it's the second held in cooperation with the Central European University's Democracy Institute in Budapest. The webinars are recorded and you can watch the others through our website, globalconpop.blog, uh, or on YouTube. You'll be notified when this one is edited and appears. The webinars are part of a research project on which, now having said it, I don't have a copy of the book in front of me, uh, uh, a research project on which the three panelists today, Adam Chanota, that's your book, that's his book, but our book, uh, Wojciech Sadurski and I have been working for some time and our edited collection with that title, Anti-Constitutional Populism, was published by Cambridge University Press at the end of March. Our guest, though, and the author of the book we will discuss, which Adam has just held up, Constitutional Imaginaries, is Yusuf Shiban, Professor of Law at the University of Cardiff and Professor of Legal Theory, Philosophy and Sociology at his alma mater, Charles University in Prague. He's also been a visiting professor or scholar in most places, including European University Institute in Florence, New York University, Prague office, University of California, Berkeley, University of San Francisco, University of Pretoria, the Flemish Academy in Brussels, and wait for it, the illustrious University of New South Wales in Sydney. This has, noise has nothing to do with what I've said. Yuzhi has published extensively in the areas of social theory and sociology of law, legal philosophy, constitutional and European comparative law, and the theory of human rights. He's won numerous awards for his writings, and he is uh, editor uh, an editor of the Journal of Law and Society, founder of the Center of uh, Law and Society at Cardiff University, and many other things. He's an eminence. He joins us from Cardiff in Wales, Adam, uh, joins us from Białystok in Poland, and Wojciech and I are in Sydney. So now to the book. Constitutional Imaginaries discusses many things, social and constitutional imaginaries, modernity and its implications for constitutionalism, democracy, the place of the state in the modern socio-political order, and social societal constitutionalism, a term that he takes from Gunter Teubner, but then embroiders in his own ways, con societal constitutionalism, both within states and without them. Uh, he then moves this apparatus, this arsenal, to focus for, in several chapters on uh, the particular imaginaries that dominate Europe and the implications of all of the above in his final chapter for understanding contemporary populism. I hope also to ask him if this time uh, what the war in Ukraine does to our thinking about all of the above. The book is rich and it's complex, and though deeply informed by legal and philosophical erudition, it's a relentlessly sociological book. Not only is it societal constitutionalism that he talks about, but he sociologizes, I think it's fair to say, our understanding of constitutions and constitutionalism. And it's specifically, not only is it sociological in, 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 um, in, in impetus, but it's a, specifically a work within the traditional functional systems theory as pioneered by Tucker Parsons and then Nicholas Luhmann and continued with significant amendment by Gunter Teubner and by Yuzhi himself. Since not everybody is as familiar with these traditions, uh, and their distinctiveness, as perhaps they should be, and I'm among those less familiar, let's start, I think we should start by examining some of the central concepts and themes to give us a frame in, in, within which we can then move to discussing particular subjects. So the first one, obviously enough, has to do with imaginaries. First of all, social imaginaries, which is where the term was coined, and then Yuzhi's application of it to constitutions, constitutional imaginaries. Yuzhi, can you enlighten us? 
Okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for uh, your introduction. And uh, uh, it's been great pleasure and privilege to be invited uh, to this network and uh, to have this book uh, commented on and criticized by the prominent Holy Trinity of Polish, Australian uh, legal theorists and philosophers and uh, uh, my great friends and colleagues from whom I learned so much in my career. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, thanks for this. Uh, your questions. Uh, I think you put it uh, absolutely correctly that uh, I try to sociologize uh, the concept of constitutionalism because one of uh, main themes of the book is uh, um, the argument that constitution uh, and even more so constitutionalism is not just a juridical concept, that it is a sociological concept. And if you want to understand constitutions as a lawyer, you must look beyond the framework of legal system, the system of positive law or political system. So that's that's certainly true. And the fact that I'm using uh, functionalist theory and uh, autopoetic theory, yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. When it comes to imaginaries, um, uh, it's again, you, you're so, it, it's so spot on that um, this is not uh, to be uh, mistaken for the concept of imagination, which is very uh, commonly used by lawyers, sociologists, political scientists. Um, uh, recently, it was uh, re-entered into constitutional theory debates by Martin Lochlin, who talks about constitutional imagination. But imaginaries is much more subtle, uh, pre-theoretical sociological concept in the sense of so sociological theories uh, of uh, uh, imagined communities. So com imagine communities in the sense that uh, 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 Benedict Anderson spoke about nations and uh, um, Ernest Gellner uh, spoke about nations and uh, 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 other social imagined communities, even by Zygmunt Bauman. So uh, very briefly, uh, to, because I know that uh, the format uh, here is don't speak too much too long. Uh, yes, imaginaries, it's uh, taken from sociological uh, theories and applied to the constitutional domain, not as a concept which should normatively and theoretically inform us about de lege ferenda, but which should help us to understand how constitutions and political, uh, political constitutions uh, get their legitimacy within and beyond states. So the focus is on European uh, constitutional imaginaries because the question is simple. How can you imagine and legitimize any constitution beyond the nation, beyond the statehood? So imaginary is, is a legitimating device but is it my legitimating device? Is it the device cooked up by a bunch of individuals or is it something more systemic or uh, belong? Well, yeah. what does it yeah, do? Yeah. Where's it from, number one? And what does it do, number two? Yes, exactly. Uh, the, uh, the paradox uh, that I uh, draw on is um, this is not just created by actors. This is not created by constitution makers, by some Hercules uh, judges. Uh, no, this is evolving spontaneously in society. And uh, this is, this is uh, Gunther Teubner's inspiration, certainly, that uh, societal constitutions are not just decreed octro year. Societal constitutions are evolving in society. And there is a lot of traditional sociology of law, of living law, living constitutions. And imaginaries, therefore, are uh, evolving uh, through the evolution of uh, the systems. So uh, they are semantic reflections of uh, 
structural tensions in modern political constitutions, uh, especially the distinction between hierarchical mastery and horizontal civic autonomy, between normative authority and factual self-creation, between transcendental validity claims, of the values, and imminent enforcement. So um, returning to your question very simply, imaginaries are not something uh, that can be uh, uh, decreed by political will or reason, but it is, uh, it is a systemic um, aspect. So to try to put it in, in more, in less specific language, imaginaries are a form of legitimating culture. Is that, does that- That could be, it could be put in that way, uh, but culture has to be thought not as a substantive um, uh, uh, and uh, as some substance, Culture is also something which uh, develops and evolves with the system. Legal culture is, uh, of course, an outcome of uh, legal operations. It's not something into which you, which establishes the law. So yes, it is. Uh, it is uh, um, uh, a way. Imaginary is simply translation of facts of power into evaluations of and legitimation of uh, the law. Okay, can I, I, I'm sorry I'm pushing for, for specification, but some of these terms have a kind of ap internal apparatus within the tradition you come from and not everybody knows them. So let me get to something even more basic, system. Uh, that's a word we all use, but of course in, in the uh, systems theory tradition it carries a lot of weight. and. Let me uh, quote a passage you quote from the great uh, legal theorist and friend of us all, the late Neil McCormick, who says something which to a normal non-systems theorist sounds absolutely kosher, even nice. Human societies are societies of persons with a capacity to realize moral autonomy in their lives. This can occur in conditions of civil society, perhaps in others as well where civil interaction of persons is possible. Civil society requires some form of law and the legal order of a constitutional state or law state is certainly a key element in securing civility. Now you're rather harsh with our friend because you think he completely misdescribes what's going on. It's not like that. And it's not like that because of the significance of systems in your whole way of thinking about imaginaries and about the way the world works rather than personal autonomous agents. So could you clarify that? So it's a sort of underpinning of, a, of much else that we've said already and are likely to be talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm being very nice to great uh, Neil McCormick, great and late Neil McCormick, uh, um, because uh, I really admire his and Otto Weinberger's uh, attempt to reconcile sociological and legal theory in what they call institutional theory of law. Uh, they uh, co-authored uh, a book, uh, I think, uh, almost 30 years ago, um, where they treat law as institution. And uh, the problem with uh, this um, uh, statement by Neil McCormack is that he cannot decide, uh, or in the end, he makes this step back from institutional perspective into agency. In the end, we are all agents and uh, law is an output of our civil society pre-legal uh, pre agencies, um, agents uh, uh, that constitute the law as from civil society. Uh, I would uh, argue that civil society is not uh, something from which law grows. Civil society is also um, uh, the uh, outcome of certain legal or constitutional culture, if you want to put it that way. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, whether we have civil society or don't have the civil society is not something which, um, uh, which uh, 
predetermines the quality of law. And this is uh, Neil McCormick's uh, argument is very similar to Ralph Darendorf's argument that uh, for the uh, economic, for the political uh, transformation, you need uh, uh, five months, for economic, you need five years, for civic, you need uh, five decades. Uh, this is what uh, Darendorf said in 1990, and we know it's uh, it never worked like this. Uh, the country with the strongest uh, civil society uh, structures under communism is now, like Poland, I mean, is now suffering from, um, uh, yes, democratic backsliding, constitutional, uh, anti-constitutional populism, whatever you call it. So civil society doesn't predetermine uh, the legitimacy of law, civil society, is also evolving together with the rule of law, together with democratic constitutionalism. It's not uh, something on which we can rely. So that's uh, that's my argument against McCormick. Don't expect that you can be saved some values evolving from civil society to support legitimacy of law. It's much more complicated, the concept of legitimacy. Everything's more complicated, and among them is law, in your understanding, in that uh, most lay people, I think, immediately associate law and the state and politics as we familiarly know it. But you are um, very much a uh, protagonist for uh, Gunther Teubner's understanding of societal constitutionalism, and you do, you follow it and you elaborate on it as occurring within states or within nation states and outside nation states in the world. And I wonder if you could expand on the significance of that. Yes, um, uh, this book, uh, especially its uh, second part, uh, is uh, uh, driven by the the big problem which the European constitutionalism is facing. How can you legitimize uh, law, not uh, including constitutional law, uh, beyond uh, uh, or in, in post-national constellation, in post-state constellation? So the whole second part is basically a critique of the modern imaginary of constitutionalism as the unity of uh, um, uh, territory, people, and uh, its laws. Yeah, it's uh, it's ancient, but of course it was completely reinvented in modern times for uh, the uh, imaginary of the nation state as the only institutional uh, container of. Um, uh, uh, Con uh, democratic constitutionalism. And um, in that respect, yes, I am uh, uh, asking how can you uh, legitimize um, uh, structures, con uh, constitutional structures, which are not uh, territorial? Just think about internet uh, or which don't have the, um, uh, the um, territorial limitations. Uh, which are not just um, um, uh, uh, driven by some people or popular sovereignty, popular legitimacy, and uh, uh, last but not least, which don't have any sovereignty, legal sovereignty, uh, ultimate authority, which, uh, so this is the question of pluralism, which is in law, pluralism, which is in society, and uh, pluralism, which is in uh, uh, post-state, uh, post-territorial constitutionalism. So that's why all those, those uh, four imaginaries, uh, which I address specifically, uh, uh, as European constitutional imaginaries are uh, driven by constitutional pluralism, by administrative efficiency, by economic prosperity, and of course, um, uh, um, by democratic legitimation of communitas, which is not national but post-national, which is a big question for constitutionalism, whether it's populist or not. Now, apart from territorial differentiation, 
in Europe, but also in the world, a key concept for you to which you tie law and you tie imaginaries is functional differentiation, which you take to be, as Weber did, uh, a specific accompaniment of modernity. How does that work in this, in what you just outlined? So not just in general, but in terms of the new problems and paradoxes and developments in Europe and in the world. Yes, exactly. Uh, these four imaginaries are uh, based not on some uh, social segmentation of states, Sorry, nations. Could you, could you just, because you, you, you talked about them, but I think if you haven't read, if you could just say a little, very little, <laughs> uh, on what each of these imaginaries focuses on and what distinguishes them. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. What you're going to say. What they are distinguished by is exactly functional differentiation, not segmental differentiation into states like in European Union. So I take the European Union almost as a uh, as a test case whether um, imaginaries can be produced by the functionally differentiated systems. And uh, the first uh, imaginary of constitutional pluralism, this is the imaginary specifically constituted by the European law. Uh, second is uh, uh, the imaginary of administrative calculemus efficiency, the idea that we can rationally organize society. It's driven uh, by the system of European administration. And um, uh, uh, the third one is by the economic system, you can call it economic constitutionalism. It's uh, driven by the uh, imperium of prosperity because uh, we, as we know, the history of European integration is history of economic integration, but the purpose of economic integration wasn't just um, uh, prosperity and uh, profit, it was also to guarantee something which is not just economic, uh, which is safety and peace. And the final one is uh, democratic, uh, uh, the, the political system. So, so economic system, administrative system, legal system. And the final, um, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, the final, uh, the fourth um, uh, imaginary is democratic communitas, uh, which uh, Europe cannot avoid. Europe uh, simply cannot avoid the question of democratic legitimacy, democratic uh, deficit, and therefore uh, those theories of political mobilization and legitimation of Europe are ever more important and uh, Europe has to mobilize. Europe always depoliticized. Now Europe has to politicize. The way it uh, will politicize, uh, I'm drawing on uh, uh, work of uh, um, uh, Calypso Nicolaidis and others who speak about democracy, not democracy, but people's uh, establishing uh, 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 popular legitimacy uh, across different, uh, uh, different constituencies and uh, uh, of uh, European public spheres, that there is not one public sphere as dreamt by or Im imagined by Habermas, but it uh, doesn't mean that we don't have public spheres in Europe and about Europe. So um, yes, a political system, a functionally differentiated political system in uh, Europe, in European Union requires public, uh, public and uh, popular mobilization even some populism, I would say. Well, let's, let's move on with that, since that's our shtick. Uh, what, in the, what is the role of maybe populism in principle, but more specifically, contemporary populism as we have come to know it, and within Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in Slovenia, and until recently, and maybe again, and in Serbia, so and, and in Britain, which was once part of Europe. Uh, what, what, what is, what, in principle, what role do you imagine it might have? And in practice, what role do you find that it does have? Yes, it's, uh, um, 
when it comes to populism, I, I really um, appreciated uh, the question mark in uh, your uh, webinars, anti-constitutional populism, because populism is one of those highly charged and evaluative concepts. Uh, for me, however, to uh, you, we can think of populism beyond normative theories. And uh, I want to think that, uh, or uh, my claim would be that populism is an indispensable part of democratic mobilization. And in democracy, uh, politicians always have to tread carefully between populist reason and expert reason. Uh, so democracy for me is a permanent question of whether you should follow uh, the common sense and follow popular voice, or uh, whether you should follow the advice of experts. In legal system, it is particularly noticeable because legal reason is an expert reason. We have, um, uh, we have uh, legal constitutional experts, but they cannot avoid uh, the uh, ultimate question of uh, legitimacy too. So if there is too much expertise, uh, politicians will be accused of uh, elitism. If there is too much, uh, dependence on um, uh, the common man or common humans, they will always be accused of populism. But uh, for me, populism is just one side of democratic communication. You, you, as you framed it initially when you were speaking, you framed it as a choice between people and experts, and then you just framed it in terms of much or too much. Is it conceivable to have a balance or a political order which respects both these elements? Yes, indeed. And this is, this is what I argue, that there has to be equilibrium between populism and expertise. And I think uh, COVID, uh, uh, Wojciech has a new book coming out on the pandemic of populists, which that I'm was really a great looking title to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to read. Um, but I think during, uh, during the COVID pandemic, it was uh, beautifully illustrated how dependent uh, pop politicians are on expertise coming from epidemiologists, coming from uh, um, um, uh, uh, medical experts, virologists, but also economists. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, how much they have to translate this episteme expertise, expert reason into doxa, into public opinion, and that they have to win the argument um, uh, in the public sphere, if you want to put it that way. So uh, we can reformulate even uh, this, uh, uh, the question of populism as a permanent uh, balance, uh, uh, balancing act, uh, permanent balancing act uh, between episteme and doxa. And um, um, yeah, uh, so, um, it applies to law as well, that uh, if you remove any uh, constituent uh, popular uh, voice uh, from constitutionalism, you will lose democracy. If you depend only on popular voice, you will lose constitutionalism. So for me, uh, this is just another name of constitutional democracy, balancing act between expertise and populism. Which, uh, Adam had, had a... At this point, uh, between this doxa and episteme, uh, Yiji, uh, it seems to me that to what degree I thought you simply mistake the rhetoric for the real processes which are, take, uh, which are taking place. It means if we, if we adopt that in Poland is a populist government in power at the moment, then they, they use, you know, technocrats very heavily. It means if you look at the preparation to the to the to the elections, they simply elaborate what sort of the structure in the particular you know the voting region is. 
And it's not only in the, in the, in the, during the pandemic, but generally it seems to me that the contemporary populist movement, they rely very heavily on this uh, episteme. The problem is how they translate later on to the doxa. So I disagree with you that is a, that is a sort of the balance, compromise between the doxa and episteme. It seems to me there's a domination of episteme still, but in the sort of the new mm, dresses. Remember, for, for those for whom doxa and episteme are new words, episteme is expertise, doxa is common understanding, or words or something like that, usually. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, your uh, comment about rhetoric is, uh, yeah, uh, really, really important and essential, uh, but uh, uh, isn't rhetoric a tool? of translation, yes? So you, you want to rhetorically argue and persuade the public that it's good to be inoculated, that it's good to have a jab against COVID. And it's interesting how the public, res uh, how the public can respond uh, to your campaign of persuasion. Uh, for me, one of the most fascinating cultural things about COVID pandemic was that how, the percentage of population um, um, inoculated against uh, COVID uh, um, or vaccinated against COVID, not uh, inoculated is probably the wrong word, uh, and uh, vaccinated against COVID uh, was uh, going, uh, was decreasing with the decrease in the public trust in government. So the least uh, vaccinated populations in Europe were in um, countries and societies with the least trust in public institutions. So that's uh, uh, so it's not just a question of rhetoric; it's a question of um, also uh, these uh, uh, these political um, uh, I would say communication, but political relationship between government and those who are governed. Something which I said at the beginning that imaginary is constituted also by uh, the structural tension between those who are in power and those who are governed. Adam, you have some, since we started with social imaginaries, you have right. some thoughts about their role more generally in general and also in Western versus Central Eastern Europe. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Iji. I mean, I try to because I'm old guy, so it's very difficult for me to to shift the paradigm. So I try to visualize what you wrote and what you what you talked to us today, and then what come to my mind actually is that there is a if I understood you correctly with your imaginaries concept, then there is a not only horizontal type of the different imaginaries, but also vertical type of the imaginaries. Now, the question for me is, uh, you mentioned here that the functional system, system theory plays the role of integrative role as such, but, but it seems to me that something more is needed on the level of uh, values or culture or collective memory, which come to my mind, which provides some sort of the um, coordination between the conflicting right, uh, uh, versions of the, of the imaginaries. So is a, <clears throat> what is it then? And then I when I thought about it, it seems to, to my mind, the most important element which uh, lay down the foundation for the imaginaries is probably the what? The social practice is connected with the collective memories of the particular communities and not necessarily the territorial communities, but you know, also extraterritorial communities. But then I was confused immediately because uh, sometimes you wrote in the chapter four that collective memory is a part of culture. Sometimes you wrote that the culture is sort of the constitutive for the collective memories. And then you also wrote that collective memory is to high degree sort of the <clears throat> sculpture by the institutions of law as, as such. So what I expect from you is an elaboration on that, on that uh, issues. It means the role of the collective memories. But before I will finish, it means it's also the question of the different collective memories in the Eastern uh, old type of Europe and the East part of Europe, our part of Europe. It means your part of Europe as well. It means 
<clears throat> what I thought that in order for the European community to function as such, those collective memories has to be compatible, right? It means not the same, but compatible at some points. At the same time, the meaning of democracy, the meaning of sovereignty is different in the Central Eastern Europe and uh, totally different in the, in the Western Europe, which means they are not compatible yet, but they may, may be, maybe became compatible. So could you please elaborate on this issue of the uh, role of the collective memory for creation of the imaginaries, constitutional imaginaries, and the issue of the uh, relationship between the Central Eastern Europe and, uh, and the old West, Western Europe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, terrific. And I will try even to um, link it to uh, uh, earlier uh, comment by Martin about how does war in Ukraine um, uh, impact on what we're talking about today on uh, imaginaries. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Adam. Yeah, it's uh, and you know that I uh, wrote about collective memories um, in the past. Uh, we had um, uh, uh, projects on it. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, memory is, uh, and this is from uh, sociological theory uh, of Talcott Parsons, which is then adopted by uh, Niklas Luhmann. What is culture? Culture is latency. So um, culture is latency and uh, uh, therefore it's all the things in the past that we don't know, that we know, that we are doing. And memory is actually um, uh, always yeah we have some collective memories but we have to be aware it's not one memory so when you say about conflicting memories and conflicting imaginaries of course uh, imaginaries are not um, um, stable uh, uh, substantive concepts they are permanent they are uh, Te just temporal outcomes of permanent societal communication. That's why even our memories, collective memories are not cumulative, but selective. And that's why every collective memory has one, uh, yeah, this is, it's not just about shared experiences, but it, it's much more about expectations of the present and the future that is at stake. So this is this is basically uh, the classic distinction between the past as shared experiences and future as uh, uh, exp societal expectations, and memory is just a temporal um, um, aspect of this uh, communication between the past and the future. Uh, so. I don't have a problem uh, with uh, the fact that imaginaries are conflictual, so they cannot be otherwise. Uh, and collective memory, uh, because they, they provide shared meaning. And here, I think you're absolutely right that when you uh, then generalize uh, our memories and translate them into constitutional uh, concepts such as sovereignty, democracy, rule of law, uh, different societies will have different uh, different historical experiences. Uh, and um, to link it to uh, the current situation in Ukraine, I think one of the biggest blunders of Putin, apart from military blunders, was when we try to legitimize this war by denazification. This this emphasis on denazification was something which turned Germany around, I believe, because you cannot um, uh, use such a perversion of such a core concept of European post-war history to justify and legitimize the war, which is doing a, a very similar uh, atrocities uh, 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 in which uh, um, uh, soldiers are doing an army uh, of the occupying army is uh, uh, um, uh, perpetrating crimes against humanity and war crimes uh, that Nazi Germany uh, did in the 19 uh, uh, during the Second World War and before that. So yes, Memories are important, but they are always important for the present and the future. And uh, uh, I think uh, for me, 
what is very important aspect of uh, constitutional populism is the risk of creating what uh, Zygmunt Bauman referred to as explosive communities. Yeah? Uh, communities that imagine their shared existence as under permanent threat and peril and uh, therefore um, uh, um, uh, building on uh, political violence, uh, hatred, uh, xenophobia, um, uh, uh, whether it is uh, within the nation, uh, beyond the nation, or uh, at supranational level. But I think I should stop here because I'm, oh, I'm that sorry. That was fascinating. That was very interesting. Wojciech, you're the terrain, geographical terrain, but also the terrain of issues that you'd specialize on covers a lot that uh, Yeji has just been talking about. So I wonder if you take it on. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and first of all, what a great book, Yeji. My warmest congratulations. Uh, I have two major questions, comments on your section on Europe. But before I do that, I really would like to go back to your societal constitutionalism. And you have presented all the good reasons for expansion of the traditional concept of constitutionalism on social relations. But all these reasons are, call it epistemic or heuristic or descriptive. But I wonder about the possible normative consequences. So my question really is like a second order question when you step back and look at it as a theory and think about what may be possible risks. And to be fair to you, much, much after introducing your societal constitutions theory, quite late at pages 144, 45, you actually pick up the issues of possible uh, risks of what you call, quote unquote, over, social, over socialization of constitutionalism and the related risk of depoliticizing. And I must say, I'm not completely satisfied about what your responses to it are. So let me rephrase those risks. Isn't there a risk? I mean, okay, in the traditional constitutional, liberal constitutionalism, we have this idea of self-restraint. Constitutionalism is political, is state-oriented, and as such, it shouldn't cover too much because if it covers too much, then say, our private lives are at risk or things which should not be subject to authoritative directives to use Raz's concept are at risk. Isn't there that type of risk in societal constitutionalism that by extending it for all good cognitive reasons upon everything, upon all social relationship, we sort of open up the room for certain quote unquote totalitarianism or, or I don't know, imperialism of constitution where everything may be constitutional and that our traditional liberal intuitions about distinction between public and private will be in danger. Yes, it's uh, another terrific comment, uh, critical comment and uh, question. And I think, uh, Wojciech, uh, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, my problem with societal constitutionalism theory as uh, delivered by Gunther Teubner, because uh, it's 10 years ago, I published uh, a critical review article of his constitutional fragments. And one criticism was that uh, there is a high risk that uh, by uh, taking constitution beyond juridical domain, you uh, make it a concept which can describe everything and, and nothing. Yeah? And uh, this risk of uh, over-socialization and depoliticization is there. And I try to uh, uh, 
tread carefully between the risk of depoliticization and at the same time, um, uh, the inflation of uh, legalist uh, notions of normative constitutionalism. And I think uh, for you to take this second order normative elements, um, it's, uh, it's very, very important uh, uh, job for every constitutionalist uh, to uh, say, well, if we, if, we, um, if we take our normative aspirations too far, we risk of becoming preachers of a particular ideology, whether it, it is something close to our hearts, liberalism, uh, or something which is more democratic, egalitarian. We talk about power of the people. Uh, and um, uh, I liked uh, a lot uh, how you introduced the concept of self-restraint. Yes, you, you use it in a classic liberal way of constitutionalism. You have to um, uh, operate on the basis of self-restraint of uh, not just democratic constituent power that you immediately tie um, the power of the people to the power of the constitution, but also self-restraint of constitutional judges, for instance, of the constitutional courts, which we didn't see a lot um, uh, um, lately. And I would say that if there is any link between the liberal constitutionalism and systems theory, it's exactly the concept of self-restraint because systems theory says that uh, every system operates on the basis of closure and self-restraint so that no system can expand into other domains. So poly uh, law into non-legal, politics into non-political. And uh, I even write in my, uh, 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 in my monograph that indeed, there is always a risk of depoliticization in societal constitutionalism, but there is a risk of politicization in populism. And if there is one basic norm of systems theory um, or one command, it, it would be, thou shall not de-differentiate. We've got a problem. We've got, usually you're Asia. frozen, if you can okay. hear. So okay, the, now the risk, okay, the risk of de-differentiation, that if we give too much power to economy, we say it's economy stupid, we realize that economy will produce so much inequality that uh, political system will respond by the rise of populism. So this is this crisis of so-called neoliberalism. It's nothing but a political response to uh, the over-economization of our political problems. Nothing and, but, nothing yeah. but, nothing but, that's it. Nothing, uh, uh, all right, yeah, uh, I, I think I, uh, yeah, I, I had some problem of stability of my- No, no, I'm, I, all I'm asking is, this was a very quick explanation for a very complex pro range of problems. You think it's only that neoliberal? Uh, I think, problem? yeah, I, <laughs> I, I know we have, a, uh, we have a genuine disagreement here, but uh, because functional, uh, uh, adherence of functional differentiation and uh, functionalist theory would say um, uh, these problems evolve when uh, uh, there is uh, one system takes over problems from societal dimensions uh, that should be dealt with uh, by other systems. So, um, yeah, for me, for instance, uh, the crisis of constitutional liberalism is uh, a typical consequence of uh, removing questions of democratic decision-making and uh, turning them into questions of uh, constitutional or legal expertise. So, um, and uh, now I think we face certain backlash and uh, going back to Adam's question about the difference between Central Eastern Europe and uh, Western Europe, although I think sometimes it's inflated and exaggerated, these differences. 
um, uh, I think is the, it is uh, that uh, uh, in uh, populists in Central Eastern Europe were much more successful because they address the question of social inequality and they speak for those who feel they didn't gain from post-1989 changes. So they speak like for losers, but not only, I, I, I don't mean the, the word losers in a morally negative way. Wojciech had another question and you may, this may be a good moment for it. I have actually two questions on European constitutionalism and hopefully after relatively short answer, we'll move on to Q and A. So my first question is more an invitation for you to elaborate. Uh, as I've read and reread your chapter on European constitutionalism, I have this feeling that you are strongly skeptical about possibilities of creating a legitimate democratic statehood or polity at a European level. And perhaps it is epitomized by your sentence at page 208, a transnational European public sphere cannot be symbolically shaped by a democratic sovereign as constituent power. And you mentioned that again and again. My question is, why? I mean, is it your understanding of the situation in the field, so to speak? Is it your account? Is it your empirical account? Is it your prediction? Is it your normative proposition? Why can't we imagine that slowly and you know with different uh, obstacles, uh, you know, but still we are moving towards European public sphere and with sooner or later some form of legitimately democratic polity at European level will emerge. Why not? Why are you so skeptical about it? Uh, there is a skepticism, uh, uh, yes, the book has a skeptical note, first about normative aspirations of legal theory, uh, and second about uh, certain limitations uh, uh, which are uh, related to democratic uh, uh, constituent uh, power legitimacy. So that's why I uh, actually shifted uh, the attention uh, from democracy to democracy, that there will be a much more differentiated uh, uh, deliberation, democratic deliberation happening at EU, and this can provide uh, democratic legitimacy rather than some sovereign uh, imag imaginary of uh, one European public sphere um, with one democratic sovereign uh, polity, I'm, I'm not saying people, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I, I also emphasize the role of not one European public sphere, but European public spheres, that we have many different public spheres, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that they are mutually exclusive that there can be an overlapping, I'm not saying overlapping consensus, but overlapping communication of democratic issues at European level. So uh, I'm skeptical about uh, European integration somehow replicating uh, ethnos, topos, um, uh, nomos uh, uh, imaginary, but I'm much more optimistic about um, democratic legitimacy evolving through alternative channels mm -hmm. of democracy and plurality of public spheres, because this is, after all, in expectation of evolution of uh, societal evolution of Europe. And uh, again, uh, I, I don't want to sound populist and bring the war on U in, in Ukraine uh, again. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think uh, it, is, it is really a breaking point in how Europe perceives itself. And okay. yeah. So may I, may, may I just ask my last question, which sort of follows up on it. And that is a question related to your gentle criticism of cosmopolitans, of people like Matthias Kuhn and Paul Schiff-Berman, etc. And in this context, 
you write about, I quote, a paradoxical meeting of legal pluralism and value monism. So to uh, articulate it to, to our listeners who may not have read it, is that Gigi says that, you know, there is something paradoxical about this type of approach, which on the one hand is morally monist because it is unashamedly liberal. So it's just one sort of single uniform moral theory. But at the same time, when it comes to European constitutionalism, it is pluralist. I hope I, I do not do injustice to what you've said. Now, I just wonder, A, whether there is any paradox there, and B, almost as a devil's advocate about whether these two aspects of your alleged paradox are really correct. So first of all, is there value monism in liberal cosmopolitanism? Well, insofar as liberalism may be seen as a sort of political theory of Rawlsian type, I mean, there is nothing monistic at all. I mean, liberalism is about tolerance for all sorts of first order theories, you know, for Christians and conservatives and traditionalists and liberals and Marxists, whoever, you know, as long as there are certain rules for, you know, uh, for their, for their modus vivendi together, right? So, so I don't think that liberal, European liberals can be accused of value monism. But on the other hand, also this legal or more specifically constitutional pluralism is something really very questionable. And maybe I would invite you to elaborate a little bit on that because for many of us, and I'm using the first uh, uh, order here advisedly, uh, constitutional pluralism is a very dangerous concept within the European Union. And you know very well why, you know, because it stands for certain tolerance for all sorts of authoritarians, uh, non-democrats, populists, etc., who claim, well, you know, EU should allow our national constitutional identity, and that's what constitutional pluralism. And then we, of course, get very angry about it, or very upset, or very afraid, probably for good reasons. So I think that for European Union to make sense as a, this emergent polity, there must be a degree of constitutionalism monist or uniformity or you know anti-pluralism otherwise it simply won't work so in a sense two parts of the equation may be may be questioned can you just elaborate on that and that's all i i want to say for the moment yes yes yeah 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 it's uh Wojciech, this is this is a great summary of my problems with uh, normative constitutional pluralism theories like uh, Berman, like Kuhn, and uh, there, and absolutely, you're, you're, it's absolutely spot on. There is a deep paradox uh, of liberalism present in uh, recent theories of constitutional pluralism, and which is which is coming from. Uh, anthropological and sociological theories of law, um, especially Berman, uh, Sally Mary, and others. Yeah? So from, from the fact of pluralism, they design, they turn the fact of pluralism into uh, argument uh, for moral um, uh, and value-based uh, networks uh, which can function so um, uh, at global level. So in the end, uh, and people like Matthias Kuhn with his, uh, with my greatest admiration for his work, uh, I believe that constitutional cosmopolitanism can operate and function only as morally uh, a value unified uh, project, which is paradoxical because liberalism originally emerged and we uh, who had to read Kelsen a lot uh, in our youth, uh, we know that Kelsen uh, uh, his theory of le uh, legal monism, legalism was based on here is a law to deal with all political and social conflicts uh, through one uh, system, the basic norm. And morality, it's and democracy, it's a relativistic project. Yeah. So democracy is relativist, rule of law is monist. Today it's the other way around. That today cosmopolitan uh, thinkers 
um, and drawing on uh, uh, even uh, societal constitutionalism uh, at global level would say, we are all living in wonderfully pluralistic world as if pluralism was a value itself. But this means that in the end, we have to integrate um, uh, this whole pluralistic universe through some shared cosmopolitan values. Uh, Paul Schiff Berman is a prime example of this. So we have legal pluralism and moral monism. Um, and this is, this is a paradox of liberalism uh, in the past and today. And I really liked uh, uh, your comment on the danger of constitutional pluralism, because you know that uh, seven years ago when I published this uh, book on sovereignty in post-sovereign society, uh, I was asking um, a simple question. How come that the concept of sovereignty is so often uh, used and is such a core concept in European constitutional law, despite the fact that European law operates on non-sovereignist uh, basis. And uh, I was told, well, constitutional pluralism, this is, um, uh, this is not chic anymore because uh, we, we've passed that stage. And today we know that, yes, uh, constitutional pluralism can be used not just for arguments to strengthen our global or, or our European uh, moral uh, monism uh, designed by basically cosmopolitan thinkers, whether it's Kuhn, whether it's Habermas or somebody else. Today, we realize that pluralism can be very regressive and can be used by a regress to the sovereignist discourses. I think we should move to q and I've got a couple of questions hanging and I'll, if I can find a place to put them in, I will, if there's a gap or a pause, but otherwise we have a distinguished audience and I'd like to hear from them. So please, I'd like us to discuss with them, please. Whichever of you thinks of yourself as distinguished, please uh, ask a question. And even if you're modest, ask a question. Carolyn, do we have any? None yet. Well, all right. One thing that I'm puzzled by, sometimes, usually you sound like an ordinary person, which is a compliment. That is, you have moral views, you criticise, you say that things go too far, and but then other times you sound like Luma uh, or, or Tucker Parsons. That is, people don't do anything. There are all these systems. They sometimes overreach. That's a bad thing, what a, whatever a bad thing means. Anyway, it's dysfunctional. Uh, and I'm, I don't know where normativity, which often gets bad press from you in the book, has, has, a, has a basis. Clearly, you feel strongly, you think that democracy is valuable, you think that some sort of, that Hungary doesn't have a place in the EU, uh, at least I glean that. Uh, is this just because the, the gears in the moral systems are slipping, uh, in, this, in the functional systems are slipping? Or is there a place for a systems theorist to say, this is, this is shitty, this is just not working well? <laughs> um, uh... I think you are right. Yeah, we are we are deeply torn as uh, persons, and uh, you know that I I write very passionately um, from normative perspectives and political perspectives as a fully committed democrat and liberal, and um, uh, at the same time I'm critical of. Uh, you're right, uh, moral normative claims of legal theory. It's, uh, it, goes, it goes before Par Luhmann and Parsons. It's basically a Weberian question. Yeah, that uh, what we do, we want to do value-free, but we ascribe a particular value to our value-free enterprise yeah, that, that we do as scholars. So again, another paradox, uh, but... Um, uh, I would distinguish here between my attempt to understand imaginaries and legitimation as something which 
doesn't depend on pure functionality. So here I am critical of uh, systems theory and functionalism that says legitimacy is just uh, a question of efficiency. It's not. It's a question of shared understanding, as I say, and imaginary is a question of shared uh, understanding. But this shared understanding is neither just a question of will or reason as lawyers and liberals tend to think, but it's also the question of societal evolution of our cultural links, of our societal links and societal communication. So yes, uh, there is a, an intrinsic paradox uh, in uh, uh, an attempt to understand society as it functions, but uh, at the same time, uh, understand uh, society, how it functions means to understand your own position. So, uh, and uh, I wouldn't give up my moral values, my legal values, but I would be very, very uh, shy even to put my political um, um, uh, commitments and uh, moral beliefs uh, into writing about law as a system uh, from that second order uh, observ uh, um, uh, observer's position. So yeah, but, but you're absolutely right, yeah. Thanks. We have a question in the chat from uh, several people. The first I think is from uh, uh, from Paul Van Cetus, who is Emeritus Professor of Sociology of Law at uh, Tilburg University, and asks, how does the perspective of societal constitutionalism apply to the case of the war in Ukraine? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Terrific question. And uh, uh, I think it shows one uh, important thing that in societal constitutionalism, politics matter. Yeah? And you cannot, you cannot discard politics out of societal constitutionalism, which sometimes uh, uh, you get uh, from uh, people like Gunther Teubner, uh, people like um, uh, um, Oren Perez and others who uh, are the finest scholars, uh, but uh, who go as far as saying, well, politics is not important. Politics is something that you cannot, um, uh, or like Jean Clamp, for instance, power is a medium. And uh, to me, uh, Ukraine war is uh, uh, a horrific example um, uh, of uh, how uh, power can turn into organized external violence and the war of aggression uh, is uh, part of it. Um, and uh, so first, it shows that uh, politics is important and international politics remains important in uh, societal constitutionalism, and you have to formulate uh, uh, societal constitutionalism, even through the lens of international, not just transnational law or global law. So it's like back to basics of international law, back to basics of humanitarian law. And uh, uh, for Europe, for European societal constitutionalism, it means that uh, uh, Europe, European Union has to realize power in its political system, but also in its economic system. I think we are witnessing now probably one of the first situation in which the supranational body uh, is engaging in the system of economic sanctions, which have really fundamental societal impact on the aggressor. And uh, um, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, um, I think, um, yeah, when, when people say, well, economic sanctions, they never work and you can get around them. Uh, yes and no, and they cannot win the war 
but they can do extremely uh, bad damage to the country which is subject of these economic sanctions. So it leads to the uh, recognition of uh, uh, economic power that Europe has, apart from other things, uh, such as when Adam mentioned collective memory, I think uh, who would imagine that uh, Germany will be sending heavy weaponry or is starting finally to send heavy weaponry to fight against the Russian army. And uh, this, is, this is a big societal and moral change in Europe, probably the biggest uh, change since 1989, if not uh, since uh, 1950. So we are uh, witnessing uh, a big shift in imaginary of Europe, self-imaginary of Europe. And uh, uh, let me, I, I don't want to speak too long, but uh, since the question was asked, uh, the essay published uh, by Jürgen Habermas in Süddeutsche Zeitung a couple of weeks ago, in which Habermas pleads that we should be very cautious. This is an aggressive war, a breach of international law, blah, 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 all that stuff. But we have to be very cautious. We have to help Ukraine not to lose the war. And we have to engage in building peace. This is like the Cold War imaginary of um, a very old man who still lives in the binary Cold War thinking logic. And he accuses leftists and liberals of going uh, gung-ho uh, for moral sanctions and economic sanctions. And um, the new generation of politicians, Baerbock uh, in particular, the Greens, uh, uh, they are much more ready to support the just war. And I mean it in the legal sense, uh, the just war that Ukraine is fighting against uh, the invading uh, power. Uh, I must say, I never felt so young because I felt uh, I'm completely siding with Baerbock uh, rather than Habermas. So big change here. You are young. This because, be, this because you are very young. <laughs> Unlike uh, the, uh, at a, at a uh, debate or discussion rather in Vienna a couple of weeks ago, Karolina Vigura from Poland, uh, and this speaks to the very concept, it's a wonderful illustration of the significance of imaginaries, talked about a shift from a Kantian perpetual peace view of Europe to a Hobbesian one. And Wojciech and I are individually marking some school leavers, Polish school leavers, essays on where they're asked to imagine or talk about after the war or about the war. And it's striking there, they all confess to being unprepared for this. This is not a topic that anything in their heads prepared them to think about. And I think that's that's profound. We have next a question from Helen Irving from Sydney University. Uh, and Wojciech wants to follow that with a couple of questions. So let me just read it. I wondered from the discussion about moments of rupture of the constitutional imaginary and maybe about the role of constitutional courts in such moments. For example, in the US where the anticipated overruling of Rowan Wade is, it seems, not just driving a wedge between Americans, but also shocking the idea of what the constitution does and, and what it stands for. Yes, thank you very much, Helen. I, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it uh, goes back to what uh, Adam said uh, earlier about conflicting imaginaries. And uh, what we discussed is whether, whether law is actually um, um, putting, uh, putting a cold shower on hot moral and conflicting values or uh, whether law is contributing to these moral um, uh, conflicts and uh, wars. And I think what is fascinating in US is how um, uh, the, the, the moral ground, the societal background is changing. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't have enough knowledge, enough expertise uh, to, to speak about uh, uh, societal and uh, cultural changes in the United States. But uh, um, like many other societies, so, there is a deep dividing line um, and uh, getting ever deeper 
um, um, in society. And uh, I wouldn't think, uh, I couldn't, we couldn't imagine the Ukraine war. I couldn't imagine um, uh, Roe Wade uh, being questioned and uh, uh, United States going back uh, to pre-Roe Wade uh, situation. So I think that uh, uh, to stay within imaginaries uh, ground, yeah, that uh, imaginaries, it only shows that imaginaries are not uh, a matter of will or reason, but societal evolution, which is beyond our political and legal control, and but which is then reflected by uh, legal institutions, by political institutions, uh, and uh, is taken up and shaped by legal or political systems. It's interesting, by the way, that we couldn't imagine uh, Donald Trump to be uh, uh, elected uh, US president in 2016, uh, to the point that even Newsweek published after the election, um, uh, the front page uh, that uh, she won it, that Hillary won it, and they had to remove the whole, they had to uh, destroy uh, the whole first version, but, Many years before 2016, I don't know exactly what year it was, in the Simpsons uh, series, there was a one episode in which uh, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. So in the culture, you have imaginaries which are not imagined in the legal system or a political system as such. So um, yes, it's, uh, it is a shocking idea and I completely agree with you, but uh, uh, yes, we are shocked by how societies evolve, like wars, like, uh, like culture wars. Yeah. The only way to deal with that is Boris Johnson's way, have two speeches, one if you Brexit is on and one of the Brexit is off. Wojciech follows up. Do you're, 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 yeah, I, know, I know, I know. I've read recently that the most frequently used sentence in the whole 2021 is unmute yourself. So, <laughs> okay. Um, two points. The first point is sort of a bit of intellectual history about when, you know, in future someone writes about Egypt Shiban. So what struck me, I don't know much of writings of Teubner and Luhmann, etc., but I know pretty well Michael Walter. And from what you are saying and how you are describing your views, you sound incredibly Walterian. You spoke a lot about shared understandings. Then you spoke in your response to my answer about different spheres, you don't use the word spheres, which is Walterian concept, but different subsystems being as separate from each other as possible and that one doesn't spill over to another. It's a sheer concept of non-domination non in Walter's spheres of justice. And when you mentioned at the end about just wars, you know, I thought, well, that sort of completes the picture of Yiji as a, as a Walterian. I looked up in your book and you don't quote him. You, he's not in your bibliography. So, so this is just a piece of intellectual curiosity. To what extent you think you are influenced, shaped, affected by Michael Walter? Because for me, he's one of the great heroes in contemporary thought. And you know, th this is just a question. And this we don't have point... heroes, we have systems. Was that, sorry? <laughs> we don't have heroes, we have systems. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let it. Uh, uh, now, now the second point uh, usually is more polemical. It's maybe not a very big issue, but for Adam, me, Martin, and you yourself, all people who have some background in Eastern Europe, it is important. So at some point you describe European, meaning EU constitutional imaginary as developed in contrast to two other major imaginaries, and you write about it around pages 205, 206. One is the nation state sort of populist, uh, radical European tradition, another is commu communist internationalism. And I just wonder whether you mean it seriously, because by the time when uh, EU, maybe in the case of Council of Europe, it would have some importance, you know, because it was so anti, 
Soviet anti-Stalinist in its pedigree. But when the EU was born in the mid 1950s, but then I mean it's 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 predecessors, you know, EEC, European Communities, etc. You know, I think that there was the communist internationalism hasn't existed. There was Stalinism and then there was post-Stalinism, which was much more statist uh, than say uh, angry non-democratic state-based nationalism like in Franco, Spain or Salazar's Portugal. So I do not think that uh, this sort of idea of withering away of the state, which you mentioned in this context at page 205 of your book, and communist internationalism played any role as some sort of negative imaginary against which we build uh, our own European imaginary, this democratic, liberal, self-restrained, market-oriented, blah, blah, blah. So wh where does it come from? I mean, this is just a, a question because somehow it doesn't fit my picture of what has happened in Europe later, uh, say 10 years, a decade, and then after the war. I might say that Yizhi's answer to this will be the end of the q and I think, because the timing is good and the discussion has been rich. Can we have no more questions? Yeah, uh, uh, Wojciech, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, Walzer, uh, I uh, quote him um, in uh, Legal Symbolism, which was actually the first part of this loose trilogy on constitutional semantics, yeah, in which uh, I, I deal a lot with collective memory and thick and thin, uh, basically, um, uh, the, this distinction between uh, thick and thin uh, moral arguments. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's close to my political temperament. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, it's uh, uh, so. Michael Waltz. Uh, I don't use him in constitutional imaginaries, um, and I, I was surprised. Uh, yeah, when you mentioned it, because I I, I sometimes uh, quote his work. Uh, I think it's probably because in this work I. Uh, my main interest was to um, uh, to draw a distinction between uh, polity and society, and to show how political theorists always and legal theorists always had a problem with sociological theory because they felt like so social science is turning all political questions into uh, social questions. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's something which uh, uh, Sheldon Wallin um, described many decades ago as polity is disappearing, everything is turning into society. And it's almost like uh, echoes of Hanak Arendt, yeah? modernity is a backsliding, political backsliding into uh, socializing uh, um, all uh, uh, political uh, issues. Uh, so this is this is about Walzer uh, and um, uh, about uh, this. Um, I, I'm afraid it's one of uh, uh, failures of the book uh, because I didn't devote uh, enough time to this to to explain why I contrast uh, uh, the communist uh, block and ideology to uh, the post-war uh, um, Western European integration, post-national integration. So uh, indeed one of many failures in the book, but uh, um, uh, the, uh, the reason why I mention it um, uh, at, uh, uh, in, uh, in the book is that I wanted to um, highlight the fact that the process of European integration was happening in the during the Cold War and in the bipolar world, uh, and uh, of, there, there was always this uh, 
conflict in imaginaries. You, you know how communist ideology always said, we are the camp of the peace. Yeah? In, uh, in Czechoslovakia, we just had 50th anniversary of the visit by Angela Davis, the US um, uh, communist campaigner, and somebody wrote a beautiful essay about it. Like, uh, And um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, my idea, uh, and uh, or the reason why there is a comment about it, is that uh, European integration had to evolve historically also as an alternative to a grand ideology which shaped 20th century and which drew on the idea of depoliticization because the communist utopia is based on withering away state, withering away politics. We all will be living in harmony in which, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, almost like uh, unthinkable now, but or unimaginable now, but uh, the European alternative was uh, shaped against it. So I would even say that uh, there is a deep risk in sociological tradition, in sociological imagination, by, uh, uh, and maybe this is a good way how to conclude that when um, uh, Charles Wright Mills wrote sociological imagination, he believed he was uh, establishing a political science of how to govern society well. Yeah. It was a critique of uh, functional differentiation of uh, Talcott Parsons, but he believed that sociology can lead us to politically uh, to, to improve politically the quality of our common life. In that way, I am a profound skeptic because I don't believe that any science can save us from solving our political or societal questions. Well, on that happy note, uh, let's conclude. This has been, I think, and it's not just politesse to say it, a very rich discussion of an integrated, complicated and rich body of ideas about some of the biggest issues that confront us now. And I thank usually for that. I thank uh, the other musketeers for their searching questions. I thank the audience for being here. And I thank Carolyn, who, notwithstanding ill health, is directing the puppet's on the stage from behind the curtain as she always does. So thank you very much. Our next, <coughs> pardon me, our next seminar in September, we'll uh, let you know the time as soon as we have it tied down, will be uh, with Gene Cohen and Ando, Andrew Arato on their book, Populism and Civil Society. It'll be in early September, I imagine. And following that, at a date also yet to be determined, we'll examine the beautifully titled work a Pandemic of Populists, written by our own Wojciech Sadurski, which is published by Cambridge University Press and will be out in a month, two months, I think, and ready for dissection uh, uh, at our next but one webinar. Thank you all for being here. And again, I mentioned that it will be recorded and that all Australians now, except Wojciech, We'll turn off their Zoom and go and watch the first State of Origin match between <laughs> Queensland and New South Wales. I'll explain to him what those words mean in a second and uh, in rugby league. So good night and good luck. Bye. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Izzy. Thank you, thank Izzy. You. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for all the questions and uh, all the comments and particularly to Caroline for uh, sending me the link. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.